Second announcement, much more important and interesting. Uh, April 22nd, what's happening April 22nd? March for Science. Um, there's a group of people from PSU Biology who are meeting over at SRTC at about 9.15 or so um, and heading down to the march at about 9.30. So um, head over there if you would like to go with the biology people. If not, we'll just see you all down there. Um, again, this is totally voluntary, you know, certainly no requirement. No, you don't get any extra credit for going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So will there still be class at normal time then? Uh, April 22nd. April 22nd is a Saturday. Oh. Yes. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, so class will be at the normal time. Actually, I'll have a lecture and uh, <laughs> we'll talk all about how cool viruses are. No, not as if I'm not doing that here already. Um, and I also, this is my reminder, I actually need to take this down to CLSB. So that's why it's here. Um, so this is a quick. Um, review of what we talked about last time, a um, little bit about the history of virology. We didn't talk much about vaccines at all otherwise, and other than they're extremely good. Um, one of the things that I posted on my Facebook page um, is that in Scotland, um, they now have a, about a 90% um, human papillomavirus immunization rate, and the rate of cervical cancer has gone down 90% since then which is really pretty darn amazing. Um, but again, vaccination, 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 um, as far as that's concerned. Again, why do we know about viruses? Why did we discover them in the first place? They were these disease-causing agents that went through filters that would block any bacteria from going through these filters. So the original definition was disease-causing agents that were really, really small. And we'll talk more about um, some of these things a little bit later on, particularly in terms of the bizarre differences that they have. Certainly small is not a very good definition anymore. Uh, but <clears throat> that's sort of the original definition for this. And so that brings us to the virus detection stuff that we talked about on Wednesday, <clears throat> having to do with the plaque assay, the sort of, I don't know, gold standard as far as looking at infectious virus particles. And if you do have a plaque assay that works, you have to have the right host. You have to have the right growing conditions um, in order to get a plaque assay. But if you've got one, it's an absolutely wonderful tool for looking at infectious particles. For looking at non-infectious particles, there's a whole bunch of other different ways of doing it. We've got electron microscopy, looking at virions. And of course, virions may or may not be infectious. Um, we also have lots of molecular techniques that I really didn't talk too much about, but hopefully it's pretty obvious. PCR, quantitative PCR quantitative reverse transcriptase, PCR, all of these things are ways to count virus genomes, which may or may not correlate with infectious virus particles. And then we also talked about hemagglutination, which is wonderful for viruses that can cross-link red blood cells and give you a very quick, in some cases actually even dirty, <laughs> but definitely cheap and easy to do. Um, method for counting the number of particles that you have that can hemagglutinate. And sort of through these you know, virus detection techniques, we talked in a little bit about the whole concept of a one-step growth curve. And the whole concept of a one-step growth curve is to try and look at simultaneous virus infection. And as I talked to a couple of people in office hours afterwards, if we could watch one virus infecting one cell, that would be perfect, because that way we could follow exactly what's going on there. We don't have, at least not, good techniques for doing that right now. And so the next best thing is to do a simultaneous infection and have lots of cells infected by viruses at approximately the same time. And then you can follow how the replication cycle is taking place. So any questions about? that um, aspect of things. Yes, no, we're all happy with one-step growth curves. Everyone who took molecular biology knows what happens next. He has a clicker question. <laughs> Which, of course, um, I didn't set up completely properly here. Let's see how well this goes. So um, <clears throat> this, again, does not count. I'm not going to start counting clicker points until next week. But I will try and post these later today so you'll know if they're actually being um, taken care of. <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> let's get started, hopefully here. Yes, start, there we go. Um, could you do a hemagglutination assay for a one-step growth curve? No, you must do a plaque assay. Yes, but it's not quantitative. Yes, but only if the virus is enveloped. Yes, but only if the virus replicates lytically. Yes, but only if the virus binds red blood cells. And again, feel free to talk amongst yourselves. The gut. <laughs> Yeah, to connect them to the course. So yeah, but if you if you paid the the six bucks before, you shouldn't have to pay it again. leaving you too long to answer the questions, right? <laughs> I'm sure there are more than 26 people here with clickers. 10, five, exactly, it's a warm up for next week. Okay, so what did people think? Um, unfortunately, this is the wrong side here, move it up here. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, 10 think you have to do a plaque assay, um, 17 of you think, yes, only if the virus binds, binds red blood cells. So certainly to do a hemagglutination assay, yes, you definitely have to bind to red blood cells. Is hemagglutination a quantitative assay? No. No? How many no's? I'm not going to do clickers. How many yes? How many say semi-quantitative? Um, why do we bother with the hemagglutination assay in the first place? Quick and easy. Quick and easy and somewhat quantitative. So it's not great, but why are we even doing two-fold dilutions when you think about a hemagglutination assay? So um, it is, yes, only if the virus is binding to red blood cells because it's, it is quantitative. It's not great, um, and the sensitivity is relatively low. But it still works. And the whole idea of the one-step growth curve is you want to be measuring across that one-step growth curve how many virus particles are being produced. Now, admittedly, these are just looking at things that can agglutinate red blood cells. So they may or may not be active virus, but at least it's in terms of producing those individual um, virions. Yeah. I'm not sure I quite understand the question about sorry. diffusion. Not sorry. Diffusion, sorry. Uh, Agglutination? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's at what dilution the hemagglutination has taken place. Okay. And, then and so then you can back calculate, just like you do with the plaque assay, what's your dilution that you have to go back to the original case. Okay, other questions? Else you had one? Yes, but yeah, yes, so that's, it, it's true, it's not actually measuring the infectious particles, right. but you're still measuring particles. And you can definitely use that for looking at a one-step growth curve. You could use any counting technique for okay. doing one of these one-step growth curves. Are you, are you infecting a host and then taking, like, the super name and, like, using that to do the testing? Right, so the question, just, just so I repeat it so people can, you know, who couldn't make it because of the wind, <laughs> um, we'll hear it here. So, um, would you be, you, could you do an infection in cell culture and then take the supernate and, and do a hemagglutination assay? That's, in fact, exactly what we have done in our lab um, looking for, and in fact, that was the example that I showed before, was looking at flu and you know, how much of this flu virus we happen to have. So, yes, you can use the hemagglutination assay, and it's just a count, it's a way of counting. You could count it in clinical samples. You could count it in experimental samples. Okay. And so any of these counting techniques. You could even do 
a animal infection assay for a one-step growth curve. It'd be ridiculously expensive and probably questionable ethically, but still, um, it's something that you could do. All we're talking about for the one-step growth curve is looking at numbers. So anyway, you could do electron microscopy. In fact, a lot of people used to do electron microscopy for following these kinds of curves. But if you didn't have a plaque assay, you didn't have a clemiglutination assay, um, you, then you have another way of, you have to have another way of counting. Yeah? For an RBC-based um, virus, is hemagglutination the only assay that you can do for a one-step growth curve? Yeah, so the question is, is hemoglutination the only way you could do that? And the answer is, if you have a plaque assay, you can definitely do a plaque assay. You could always do electron microscopy. So it's by no means the only way that you could do it. It certainly is one way that you could do it. Okay, other questions on this, sort of the whole, you know, one-step growth curve, et cetera? Okay, so... <clears throat> Now we move on to another fun concept. Everyone thought they're going to be doing statistics in virology, right? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so <clears throat> this is also, again, a, a rather important concept, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on it here. But basically, the whole idea here really has to do with the fact that any virion, and particularly an infectious virion, is a single particle, and a cell that gets infected by virions is a single particle. So what you're looking at is random interactions of single particles or discrete, discrete statistical analysis. You know, who loves, everyone loves discrete statistical analysis. But basically what that means is interactions between viruses and cells, because you've got lots of viruses, lots of cells, each of them is an individual particle, is very well described by the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution, as I'm sure all of you remember from statistics, is down here at the bottom. Um, the fraction of one set of single particles that's associated with the other kind of single particles in there is relative to e to the minus m, which we'll get back to in just a second, m to the k divided by k factorial. So what do we mean by all of these M's and K's and so on and so forth. So proportion, and again, this is just a statistical measurement. Now, how, what percentage of cells are infected with, or actually better yet, interact with K number of viruses is going to be equal to E to the minus M. What's M? M is known as the multiplicity of infection, or MOI. Um, and all that MOI is is number of, and actually this should be infectious virus particles, divided by the number of cells. So it's how many infectious viruses you have per the number of cells that you have. You can count the number of viruses you have. You just did your plaque assay, so you've got an idea what your number is. Cells, you can count through all kinds of different ways. If you're lucky, you have a flow cytometer or some other way of counting cells, otherwise you just plaque them out, do colony forming units like everybody did in the mutant viruses from hell lab the other day. Um, so you know how many cells you have, you know how many viruses you have, and you can mix the two of them together. And because the infectivity has to do with this Poisson distribution, you can get a good idea of the percentage of infected versus non-infected cells. And so this is, this is where the concept starts to be a little weird. You say, well, I'm going to infect my cells. I'll mix you know, one virus with one cell, right? And then it'll be infected. Well, the problem is if you do that in a, <clears throat> pardon my really cheesy animations here, five virus particles and five cells, five particles and five cells, if you mix those together, most of them are going to have just one, but some are going to have two and some are going to have zero. And this, of course, is exacerbated the more cells and the more virus that you have. If you now have an MOI of two, now we've got 10 PFUs and five cells. You'll have probably most of them that have one, some that have two, some that have three, etc. And you can follow through this whole process, do an MOI of five, some are going to have as much as, in this case, seven, some three, some four, some five, etc. So this is, again, very well described by the Poisson distribution. 
I just plot it out here. Um, there's a really nice uh, description of this if you go on Google Books for Poisson distribution in virology. But this is just plotted um, right here. We've got the percentage of you know, whatever it is, you know, this one particle that has this number of the other particles. But we'll say for virology, that's going to be the percentage of cells that have one or more infectious viruses associated with it. And if you just plot this versus your A in this case, and we're going to go you know, A is going to be your MOI, an MOI of 2, you're going to have a considerable proportion, it's about 13% here, which are not infected at all. Zero virus particles associated with it. This is a problem if you're trying to do something like a one-step growth curve where you want to have everything infected. So, well, I've got twice as many virus particles as I do cells. They should all be infected, right? Actually, no. It's actually a pretty considerable proportion. At an MOI of 3, you've got a reasonable percentage. Once you get up to an MOI of 5 or an MOI of 10, then we're getting to a relatively low proportion of uninfected cells. So as I mentioned for the one-step growth curve before, on Wednesday, we want to have an MOI of 5 to 10. Why is that? That's to make sure that this number down here is extremely low. So another way of looking at this is looking again at this same distribution. This is just down here. And if you look now at the number, or I should say the percentage of viruses that have zero that are associated with them, zero factorial is one, m to the zero <coughs> is also going to be one, and so now you have e to the minus m. So if you have an MOI of one, the percentage of uninfected is going to be 36 percent. That's huge. Actually, almost 37 percent. Um, and in an MOI of two, which you just looked at, 13.5 percent. MOI of five, 0.7 percent. And MOI of 10, what's that, 0.005 percent in terms of their uninfected, so P0. Um, another way of thinking about this is that's going to be everything which is, <clears throat> excuse me, infected is one or higher. Everything which is zero is going to be your uninfected. Does that make sense? So it's, it's always going to sum to one here in terms of proportions. So here again, this is still you know, 0.367 at an MOI of one means that 63% of your cells are infected with one or more um, particular virus particle. Another way of looking at this is 1 minus P0. So an MOI of 1, 63%. MOI of 2, 86.5%. MOI of 5, now we're getting to almost completely infected. And MOI of 10, much, much closer. So does this kind of sort of make sense? How many of you had statistics? Not me, I never had statistics. Good. I wish I had, had done more of a statistics course. You're all really familiar with the Poisson distribution? Do you have? <laughs> no? <laughs> I like honesty. Honesty is a good thing. <laughs> Never heard of it before. In statistics, you don't talk about the Poisson distribution? <sighs> OK. <laughs> I got to talk to these math and stats people. Um, or our dean, who's a ex-mathematics professor as well. So um, how many of you have a device that does exponents? Good. Find somebody who's got one. <laughs> so <clears throat> approximately what percentage of uninfected cells would you have with an MOI of 3? 36%, 13%, 5%, 1%, or 0.1%. You should actually be able to do this without a calculator, but you can get a ridiculously accurate number um, if you have one. 
Should I just give you a minute or a minute and a half better? Eh. <laughs> So a number of people have asked me about whether you need to bring a calculator for tests. Um, I will give you a table of numbers if you do need them for a test. So calculators are not required for tests. OK, so what do people think? Show our results. 5%. It's actually really close. What is the actual number? 4.9 something percent. And actually, you could have probably figured this out just by looking at the notes on the previous two pages, if you're able to print them out and see that you know, 13 is your MOI of 2, 36 is your MOI of 1, 1 is your MOI of 5, et cetera. So 5 would have been a pretty good guess, even if you didn't have a calculator. So, <clears throat> so everyone's happy with this. Great. It'll be easy on the exam. Everyone will answer that question properly. Um, OK, so <clears throat> quick review of what we talked about up to now. Um, again, virus discovery we talked about. Uh, this really open question that, again, we could talk about for hours, days, years, um, whether they're alive. Um, cool things to do with viruses. I only just barely scratched the surface um, last time. But phage therapy, I think, is a really exciting possible technique. Gene therapy, um, these things are really exciting. Um, and plaque assays, one-step growth curves, and now finally our, our Poisson distribution. And the, the real reason for thinking about the Poisson distribution has to do with setting up these, these one-step growth curves, sort of why do you need these very high MOIs. And a classic problem in all virology labs is you never have enough virus. And, you know, anyone who's in my lab knows this far too well. Um, so it's a, um, you have to sort of play around a little bit with your plus one distribution, try to get your MOI as high as possible, but even then um, doesn't always end up working out as well as you would like. So switch gears a little bit, want to talk about virus structure. Um, start a little bit with replication strategies, but really much more about classification of viruses. How many of you heard about the Baltimore classification? David Baltimore, Nobel laureate, discovered, well, co-discovered retroviruses. Um, really has to do, it's all about the messenger RNA. And as we talked about previous lectures, viruses all need cellular machinery to make that messenger RNA into protein. So it's key how you get that particular messenger RNA. So that's all about the replication strategies. There are either six or seven Baltimore classifications. I prefer the six version. I'm not going to ask you, you know, which one is which on an exam. Uh, but it's good to know that there are lots of different ones, and that has to do also with not only how the messenger RNA is made, but what kind of nucleic acid is in the virion once it actually gets packaged. Um, we'll talk about how to get structures for various different viruses, you know, this kind, this kind, the soccer ball-like virus, um, and this one, which we really have absolutely no clue um, on how these are being put together. But most viruses have really geometric forms. So again, who, who knew this was going to be a math course, right? Um, so we talk statistics. We're going to talk geometry. Um, a lot of the geometry of virions has to do with very fundamental mathematical rules, concepts, whatever you want to call them. Uh, basically. In order to get a large volume in a small surface area, you want to have something that's pretty close to a sphere. How do you make something that's close to a sphere with a lot of, actually a relatively small number actually, of repeating subunits? You want to have something that has icosahedral symmetry. If you want to have something which <clears throat> all of those individual capsid proteins that we talked about before fit together in the same way, a helical arrangement is also really useful because it gives you really good symmetry. And so that's sort of the, the idea here is a, a symmetry um, aspect. Turns out that viruses have evolved these really fascinating ways of playing around a little bit with these kinds of symmetries. So we'll talk about the so-called triangulation number. 
and this is always some of people's favorite things, topics to talk about um, in the class, and we'll show some examples. A little bit about envelopes. Envelopes, because their lipids are really kind of loosey-goosey, um, they're not nice and well-defined. And then a little bit of assembly. We probably won't have a chance to talk about virus taxonomy today, um, given where we're at. So what do we can talk about classification-wise? It's about the package genome and the message RNA in the Baltimore classification structure. Anyone knows what this acronym is for? Keep it simple, stupid, exactly. Um, and that really does seem to be the paradigm for most virion structures, is nice and simple, helical or icosahedral. So um, we talked a little bit about this before, but it bears repeating because this is something that we are going to go over basically ad nauseum with each new set of viruses that we talk about. Um, there really are seven steps to virus replication. Virion associates with the outside of your cell, usually some kind of receptor. We'll talk a lot about receptors. Different viruses use different receptors. Um, they can be proteins, lipid, carbohydrates, etc. That is going to depend, or I should say the receptor is going to tell you what cells that virus can actually infect. And this is also known as tropism um, or host range. These are those kinds of things. Once you have binding, then somehow that virus genome has to get inside the cell. Sometimes it's just the genome that gets inside the cell. And sometimes it's the whole virion that gets inside the cell. And then the genome is released. For most bacterial viruses, it's virion on the outside, genome goes in. That was the whole uh, <clears throat> in the Hershey Chase experiment showing DNA was a genetic material because virion was staying on the outside. A lot of animal viruses, actually, the virion comes to the inside. Yeah? Uh, just a clarification. Um, can you go over tropism one more time? Yeah, so tropism is just another way of talking about how you have virus cell specificity. Um, and that's you know, the tropism for a virus to a particular cell is going to depend on the receptor that happens to be on that cell. And so it's a cell surface molecule of some kind. And basically, any kind seems to be able to work depending on which virus you're actually talking about there. Um, yeah, so how do you get in? Um, or how do you get your genome in? Uh, my favorite way of getting your genome inside the cell um, is what T4 does, which is literally drill through the membranes. Absolutely incredible. We'll look at some of the videos for that, just in case you haven't seen them already. It bears repeating. Uh, damage to the cell membrane or some kind of internal membrane, which allows the genome to be released. In some cases, there's actually fusion. This is particularly true if you have an enveloped virus. Remember, enveloped viruses have lipid membranes around the outside. Um, lipids love to fuse with each other. So that lipid membrane could fuse with some cellular lipid membrane. And then whatever's on the inside of that membrane in the virus, the enveloped virus is going to be released in that process. We'll see that quite a bit. In a few cases, actually, the capsid itself gets degraded inside the cell. And that's the way that the genome is actually released. So once you have this genome release, which we have up here, then in the vast majority of viruses, there are a few exceptions to this, but the vast majority have what is called early gene expression. So the genome gets made into messenger RNA, which then gets made into protein. And that is almost always going to be proteins that are important for making more of the genome. So whenever we talk about early genes, they're going to be the ones which are important for genome replication. And so really obvious ones would be polymerases, polymerases which are going to be polymerizing the, <coughs> the virus genome. So when is all this happening in your one-step growth curve? It's all happening in this boring time of your one-step growth curve where you're not seeing any viruses, I should say virions, actually being produced. Early enzymes, replication of your nucleic acid, all of this is in your eclipse um, and or latent period, which is here. So, since this is a molecular virology course, we're mostly going to be talking about 
all of this stuff which is going on here at the very beginning. After you have lots of copies of your genome, that's the nucleic acid, it needs the bag to go around that nucleic acid in order to make virions. So, oh, sorry, I just got cut off a little bit here. Um, late messenger RNAs um, are made from nascent or new genomes. So, the late genes, not surprisingly, these are the ones that code for the things that are going to make up the structure of your virion. These can be either direct structural proteins, the ones that actually end up in the virion, but many virions are quite complex and, you know, here's a nice example of a good complex virion. Um, this one probably as well. Many of these can't what we call self-assemble, so if you make those capsid proteins, they can't actually come together to make a virion, and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on. So they need help, and in many cases, the help comes in terms of what people call scaffolding proteins. So it's like when you're building a building, you put up scaffolding on the outside, that helps you to build the building, because it's not stable until the whole thing gets put together. Once the whole thing gets put together, you take away the scaffolding proteins, and the virion is perfectly happy. So you take away the scaffolding, the building hopefully um, still stays up. So <clears throat> that's one thing that a lot of these late proteins are involved with. The other one really has to do with getting the virus out, or I should say the virion, out of the cell at the very end of your process here. So put them together, somehow they've got to come out of the cell. The classic way that you have virions released and the way we looked at our virus replication cycle before is lysis. Virions get assembled inside the cell, then poof, the cell explodes, all of the virions are released. That's actually probably a relatively rare way that viruses replicate. Um, many more seem to replicate in a much more, I don't know what the best adjective for this, um, mellow way, <laughs> um, because if you think about it, we talked about this when we talked about viruses in general, uh, if you're killing off your host every time you replicate and you're host dependent, it's not a really good way to survive. So um, many viruses are going to reproduce by just re releasing a few virions, not killing their host cell. Um, some viruses actually move directly from cell to cell. We'll look at some examples of that as well. Um, and some actually move from organism to organism through yet another organism, the so-called vectored viruses. And um, hopefully everyone's heard about the nastiest animal on the planet as far as infectious disease is concerned. What is it? Mosquito, Mosquito exactly. So vectoring there. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you actually get your coat as it's being made. So these are, um, these are great slides, and I, part of the reason I show them here and emphasize them so much, when you're going back and studying for who knows what, um, it's really good to use this as sort of the baseline for thinking about any of the viruses. They're all going to be slightly different relative to each other, but sort of taking this as a model to think about for each of those sets of viruses I think is a really, really good one. Yeah? Um, how long can a virus continue replicating post-mortem of its host organism? How long can a virus keep replicating post-mortem um, of an organism? So. It's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, so in many of these cases, so like the budding cases, I got them in obfuscate, really good at obfuscating. So um, many of these cases, like particularly like the budding ones, the cell is actually not dead. And it's just slowed down its growth, sometimes not even slowed down its growth at all. So that's one thing. Um, in terms of viruses replicating um, and making more virions, in some cases, it's very soon after you have virus infection that the cell is no longer viable. So is that alive or dead at that point? <laughs> and so how do you find a live cell or a dead cell? Um, T4 is a, is a great example of that. A Couple of minutes after infection takes place with T4, the cellular genome is chopped into little pieces. So is that cell dead now or is it still alive? It's still metabolizing, but there's no way it's gonna be able to pass along as genome anymore. So. It's, it's a bit of a tough question. <laughs> so yeah, and again, as always, it varies. Okay, so again, this is, some of these first lectures are really kind of broad brush stuff, um, and we'll come back and talk about the individual ones um, a little bit later on.
So I did want to talk about the classification of different viruses. This is the figure from the textbook. I will go through my own, which I like a little bit better um, a little bit later on. This has to do with the classification of different viruses. Um, and hopefully not beating the dead horse too much here. Um, it's all about the messenger RNA. So this messenger RNA through the cellular ribosome, and ribosomes are always going to be these two little ovals here um, that associate with each other and translate. So messenger RNA is, and making that messenger RNA is really critical. Turns out that there are quite a few viruses that actually have a single-stranded RNA genome. So when that genome gets released inside the cell, it can be translated immediately if and only if it has the right strand and sequence that can then be translated through the genetic code. So what's known as a positive strand, and we talked about this a little bit last term in molecular biology, but the positive strand RNA viruses, this means the genome, once it gets released inside the cell, can be translated immediately. So these then generate your early proteins. Um, vast majority of plant viruses, interestingly enough, quite a few human viruses have this strategy. Bring in that single-stranded RNA, gets translated immediately. This is great, except for the fact that all of our late proteins have to be made by nascent genomes, so newly made genomes. So you also have to be able to replicate this RNA, and there's nothing cellularly that's really good at replicating RNAs. So in some ways it's a great strategy because when you come in, um, you can translate it immediately, but in other ways maybe not so much. So <clears throat> another, and this is now the most common class in bacteria, are the so-called double-stranded DNA viruses, and that's because they've got double-stranded DNA inside their virion. Once they get released inside the host, this is really obvious because, heck, our genomes, all cellular genomes are double-stranded DNA. So this is a quite straightforward process. You've got very often a cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can make your messenger RNA and make all of these proteins. There are a few bizarre ones that are partly single-stranded and double-stranded DNA. We're not going to talk about those because they're basically the same as this one. Uh, single-stranded DNA. There are a number of viruses that package single-stranded DNA, which is very bizarre. Why or how would you end up with a genome that's just a single strand? Because there is no translation machinery that can do anything with a single strand of DNA. So instead of like up here where you've got a single strand RNA, which can make early proteins immediately, you have to undergo a replication step to get double-stranded DNA, and then from double-stranded DNA go to your messenger RNA. So why the heck bother with single-stranded DNA? I've got some theories about how this works, but the main thing just seems to be the, the KISS approach. Keep it simple, and more importantly, keep it small. Because single-stranded DNA is a lot easier to package than double-stranded DNA, because you don't have as much here that you have to deal with. So, and we'll talk a lot about these different kinds of viruses as well. So these ones kind of sort of make sense. Uh, the bizarre ones um, are those where you've got RNA, which doesn't code for proteins, actually the complement of the RNA which codes for proteins, and then the double-stranded RNA, which has a positive strand and a negative strand, of course, that are base paired with each other. Negative strand RNA viruses, these are some of the really nasty ones, Ebola, flu, etc. These all have to have a viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the virion. Now, why is that? That's because cells don't have RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, or not RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which can make large enough pieces of RNA to make whole genomes. So any kind of either negative strand single-stranded RNA virus or double-stranded RNA virus has its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that comes in as a protein when that genome is released, and it has to have that. Yeah? So the negative-stranded um, RNA um, virus brings its own machinery? Hmm? Brings its own 
RNA machinery to make that messenger RNA. Yes. And it turns out that the double-stranded RNA viruses do that too. In theory, you could just have an RNA helicase that would separate off that positive strand and use that for translation. But it turns out that none of them do that. Yeah. Okay, so the, <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase your question, <laughs> um, is basically you know, how single-stranded are these single-stranded genomes? So they're only going to be double-stranded if it's a complementary sequence. So they have to be self-complementary to each other. Now, it turns out that almost all of these have at least short little sequences that are self-complementary to each other. So you have to have some kind of helicase activity to separate those apart. Usually, it turns out it's the RNA polymerase or the DNA polymerase in the case of these um, single-stranded DNAs, which will do that. And so they can take care of that. But it turns out that those secondary structures, so where you do have double-stranded pieces that form, are absolutely critical for how these viruses function. So we'll, we'll get back to that when we talk about those a little bit later on. Yeah. Yeah, so the question basically is here, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this a little bit later on, but, but how, how does it know, basically, to totally over-anthropomorphize, <laughs> um, to start replicating, where that replication starts, when replication starts, et cetera? And we'll talk about that when we talk about these viruses um, a little bit later on. Um, those of you who've been not asleep yet or blown away um, will notice this last class down here at the bottom. Um, these are the virions that package single-stranded RNA, but instead of using that positive single-stranded RNA to translate immediately, they actually make a DNA, and that DNA then goes back to RNA. Incredibly bizarre. Um, and that's why David Baltimore got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, because he and Howard Temin um, had figured out that there was this process where you went from a single-stranded RNA made a single-stranded DNA to a double-stranded DNA, which then finally made your messenger RNA, which ends up being translated. So these are those different classes. Um, the Baltimore himself put them together, similarly to this in a review paper, where he uses Roman numerals to describe each of these different classes. Unfortunately, these numbers don't match the numbers here, which I wasn't talking about the different Baltimore classes. 99% of virologists will use these particular kinds of classes here. So class one, Baltimore viruses are the double-stranded DNA viruses, which easily can make your messenger RNA. Class two, are the single-stranded DNA viruses that have to replicate into double-stranded before they make their messenger RNA. Then you've got the positive-strand RNA viruses, which can be used directly to translate, but you need to make a negative strand because all of your new genomes, which you're going to be doing your translation from for all the late proteins, then have to go through this step. This is class four. Your double-stranded RNAs are class three. Your negative-strand RNAs are class five. And then these bizarre retroviruses, RNA to DNA, and then back to RNA, are class six. I made my own cartoon of this um, that may or may not be easier to follow. Um, class one in the virion, this light blue icosahedra, as it were, um, packages these kinds of DNAs. That goes to your messenger RNA. Class two becomes double-stranded. That then gets transcribed into messenger RNA. <clears throat> Excuse me. Class three, double-stranded. You can make the messenger RNA from the negative strand. Class four, the positive strand, 
first makes a negative strand, then that negative strand gets copied into your positive strand messenger RNA. Class 5, the minus strand, the negative strand RNAs, those can get made directly into messenger RNA because that's the template that you use to make all of your messenger RNAs. The bizarre retroviruses, the class 6, start by making a single-stranded DNA. That then makes a double-stranded DNA. Should be double-stranded. There we are. Uh, and then that goes to your messenger RNA. So hopefully you're know, beating the, the dead horse here. This is another way of thinking about it. So just, you know, again, sorry to belabor the point, but I think it's worthwhile um, repeating um, a couple of times here. So completely clear. What does that mean? Get your clickers out. Uh, <laughs> so which of the Baltimore class of viruses do not use RNA as an intermediate in genome replication? Class 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. If I gave you a question like this on an exam, I would probably actually not do these different classes. I don't expect people to memorize classes. I think it's a worthless thing to do. But that being said, Hopefully, all of you have your notes or you've been thinking about these last couple of steps here. And the key to this question, maybe to give it away a little bit, is genome replication. Five. <laughs> I'm not that mean, really. Uh, so, uh, majority think one, i.e., well, actually, class two. Why? Those are the single stranded DNA viruses. One could argue, and this is probably not the greatest clicker question, that class six, which are those retroviruses, could be, um, and that's because I didn't really talk about how you get your genome back from that messenger RNA, and I probably should have. So, because the actual genome is made through that RNA, the messenger RNA actually turns out to be the genome. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about retroviruses um, a little bit later on. Yes, you had a question. OK, that was, um, and then, you know, three, four, and five, yeah, these all need RNA. So, um, <clears throat> OK, so <clears throat> chapter one, wow, it took him like three lectures to get through one chapter. Uh, that's because, again, this is a much more general kind of thing, and I, I like to go over these things in more detail. These are things that are going to come up again and again um, as far as the rest of the course is concerned. What's a virus? Not a virion. Take home message there. Why bother? Not because they make humans sick, because they're all over the place and they're really cool. Uh, how did you find them? Because they made stuff sick. Um, how many viruses? We talked about this, you know, probably ad nauseum now. Um, and then just today, the virus replication cycle, um, Baltimore classes. Any more questions on this? And I, I, kind of put these review slides in here to allow people to go back and revise things before midterms happen. Yeah? So if you don't need to memorize the Baltimore classifications, what do you want us to take away from that? Um, basically, we will be going through a lot of them. A lot of people use them. Um, so in theory, this course is supposed to be about learning things as opposed to knowing things for exams. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons that I spend my time on it. Uh, I could imagine a question on Baltimore classes about you know, how many Baltimore classes have package RNA 
for instance, something like that. It's just the numbers. I don't, I don't like the whole numbering system. Um, and partly, again, because the book uses a different one. So that becomes really, really confusing. 99% of the virus world uses the standard Baltimore classification, the ones we just talked about. And then our book ends up using a different one. Go figure. Um, so yes, uh, for a change, we won't have a clicker question immediately at this point. So uh, virus structure, uh, KISS, keep it simple. Um, mostly because the majority of viruses are rather small, and it turns out even some of the largest viruses use exactly the same geometric principles. A very simple process in terms of putting together these virions. Usually smallest or a very small number of proteins. In many cases, many viruses have one and only one capsid protein. Um, many more have two capsid proteins. So a relatively small number. Even some of the largest viruses have a very small number of different capsid proteins. Now, there's a problem with capsids, which often is called the capsid paradox. And that is, when you're floating around as a free virion, you want to be very stable. Because you've got to get from one cell that you're going to infect to another cell that you're going to infect. But the genome that's inside the virion has to be able to be released once you get inside that cell or to that appropriate cell. So it's got to be stable under some conditions and unstable under other conditions. And so this is the, what people call the capsid paradox. You know, stable outside the cell, unstable on the inside of the cell. We'll talk a lot about the different um, capsids and how they're formed um, a little bit later on. What people also will talk about is capsids being in sort of a metastable state. So some cases they're stable, some cases they aren't. Icosahedral symmetry, we're going to spend a long time talking about icosahedral symmetry, and in fact my underinflated soccer ball here is a really nice example of icosahedral symmetry. Icosahedral symmetry just in and of itself, just an icosahedron, is great. And if all viruses had small enough genomes, they probably would use this particular way of putting things together. But it turns out that even a regular icosahedron, which just has five-fold axes of symmetry, isn't going to be big enough for most nucleic acid genomes. Why is that? This is a ridiculously inefficient way of coding genetic information. So nucleotides are actually relatively big relative to proteins, because you need three nucleotides for every single amino acid. Uh, turns out that you need to make bigger stuff. And in terms of icosahedral symmetry, um, the concept of quasi-equivalence is really a very important one, and we'll spend quite a while talking about that. So how do you know what these virions actually look like? And I should say virion structure here rather than virus structure. Transmission electron microscope, uh, microscopes are the main way to look at these virus particles. This one here, I'm going to turn the lights down here real quick, um, is the microscope which is down in the basement of SB1, the one that we use all the time. Um, Titan Cryos, this is sort of the top of the line microscope, usually used for cryo-electron microscopy. There's one down at the CLSB, and Steve Reichel um, in the chemistry department uses that for um, his studies. To be able to visualize viruses, usually you need to stain them in some way. The staining that we usually use is what's called negative stain. And the negative stain here, usually using some kind of heavy metal, Uranium, tungsten are the classic ones. What you're really visualizing here is the black stuff on the outside. That's absorbing the electrons. Why the heavy metals? Because they absorb electrons really well. And so what you're looking for is an outline. And then the negative, in this case, again, which is bright, is going to be your virion. So we've got filamentous virions here in white. We've got classic bacteriophage, icosahedral with a helical tail. This one is an orthomyxovirus. This is flu, um, where again, it's stained around the outside. Um, this is, I think this one's a coronavirus. This is an adenovirus. So um, negative staining, just taking your virion, 
mixing it together with a heavy metal containing solution, really easy to do these kinds of experiments, and then observing it under the electron microscope. This is what you know, we do all the time in my lab. On the other hand, um, positive staining is a lot harder approach to use, but <clears throat> this allows you to actually now see the individual virions. Um, to do this, you almost always are taking your sample and cutting a very thin slice of it, um, also known as a thin section. And when I say a thin slice, these are on the orders of, you know, some people actually get them down to tens of nanometers, hundreds of nanometers in terms of an individual slice. So what's called an ultra microtome with diamond blades, you need to make these things. Pain in the neck to do really good um, sectioning. But once you get it, it's really, really nice. And so this is an example of a thin section where you now see positive staining of the viruses. They're dark. And particularly in this case, this is uh, HIV. You can see the membrane on the outside and then the core on the inside of that particular structure. So thin section, it's great. You can see cells as well as the virions, but the sectioning and staining is a really tricky method of using. What people are using more and more now is cryo-electron microscopy. We'll look at a lot of cryo-electron microscope images here. Again, those massive microscopes. So by the way, that Titan cryos is about 20 feet tall. Um, these are big microscopes. Um, and then, if you get really, really lucky, um, your virion will crystallize. And you can do x-ray crystallography and get atomic resolution structures from your <clears throat> x-ray diffraction pattern. Cryo-electron microscopy is getting good enough now that in some cases you get really close to the same kinds of resolution here, almost atomic resolution with cryo-electron microscopy. And we'll look at a number of these structures as we, as we move on through the course. So how do you go about doing this? Um, single particle reconstruction. Steve Reichel, I'm sure, could tell you a lot more about this. But the basic idea is you take many, many pictures of your favorite virus and using lots of computational tools, you average all of these guys together and in three dimensions come up with a structure that looks like this. So this particular structure, um, a related virus to SSV1, which is the one that we use in my lab, um, was actually done through these techniques. And so lots of two-dimensional pictures taken in ice, that's why it's called a cryo-EM, and then all of those put back together in order to give you a three-dimensional structure. So that's a <clears throat> um, probably the most common technique in terms of getting virus structures um, these days. And most of the virus structures that we'll talk about in terms of whole virions are going to be from cryo-EM. Yeah? Is that a 3D printed virus? So this is a 3D printed um, virion structure, yeah. Yeah, no, I've got... Um, a few of those, <laughs> getting more and more of them. I'll bring some more other 3D printed structures a little bit later on. Uh, X-ray crystallography, if your virus crystallizes, um, this is a absolutely fabulous way to get up to atomic resolution data um, on your virion. Much more commonly, you'll have the individual proteins from your virion, and you can get a high resolution structure from those which is crystallized by themselves separate from the virion. And then you've got a low resolution image, either from cryo or sometimes even just an, a negative stain, TEM. You can take the structure that you now know from the individual protein and put it all together and then hopefully come up with a structure. Um, so this is an example here where we have a, I forget if this was a capsid protein, actually it's an enzyme, but the whole idea here is you crystallize your protein and what do we say by crystallizing the protein? That means that all the proteins have fit together in a completely symmetrical way. And what that means is when you shine an X-ray beam at it, each of those individual proteins, which are all lined up exactly the same, are going to be diffracting the electrons in exactly the same way. So you end up with a diffraction pattern. Lots of fun calculations here. You end up with what's called an electron density map. Um, basically, this is where you're getting diffraction from versus not getting diffraction. 
you have the protein sequence that you know, you fit that protein sequence to your electron density, and then you get rid of the electron density, and this is the model which you have based on that particular structure. So let's look at some of these individual variants. Smaller, for the most part here, is better. Um, a few small viruses can what we call self-assemble, and that is that if you just take that individual protein, and in some cases it literally is just one protein, get that protein, throw it into a test tube, it will make capsids just by itself, lacking anything else at all. Uh, that turns out to be a rare case and only works for the small viruses because they also are packaging small genomes in that particular process. I mentioned already nucleic acid is ridiculously large um, and you know, using a non-overlapping code is incredibly inefficient. So you need a lot of your genome to be encoding your capsid protein. Some of the smaller virus genomes, and we'll talk about some of these towards the end of the course, about half the genome is actually coding capsid protein, um, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, so <clears throat> that capsid protein, and that's just one gene. If you have multiple different capsid proteins, clearly you need a bigger genome, which is you're gonna need a bigger capsid, which means you need more capsid proteins, which you need more bigger gene. You can notice that there starts to be a problem here. Um, so, that is a really <clears throat> fundamental issue with thinking about virus structure. And so if you can have one particular protein that's coded by one DNA sequence and repeat that particular protein many, many times, that's going to be the most efficient way to package your genome. And there are two basic ways that that happens. Probably the simplest of those is actually the helical arrangement. So we'll see lots of these little commas. Each of these little commas represents one capsid protein. And that one capsid protein then interacts with all of the other capsid proteins. And in this helical form, this guy interacts with this guy just the same as it interacts with this guy, which interacts with this guy, etc. All wrapped around together. The other way, I'm sorry, the, the problem, I should say, with these helical is the ends. What do you do with the ends? You gotta do something about ends. Ends are a problem. How do you deal with ends? You don't have ends. You have a sphere or some approximation of the sphere. And so that gets us to icosahedral symmetry. And here, icosahedral symmetry is just defined by getting back the same structure after different rotations. And in the case of an icosahedron, there are three axes of rotation that you can rotate around and get the same thing back. There's a two-fold axis of rotation. I've got my little model here. Um, two-fold axis of rotation like this. I rotate that 180 degrees. It's the same thing again. You also have a three-fold axis of rotation, which is here. Rotate 120 degrees, get that same thing back, etc. And then you have the five-fold axis of replication. You ro rotate 72 degrees, 72 degrees, 72 degrees, 72 degrees. That gives you an icosahedrally symmetric particle. And the great thing about that is you can now use these individual capsid proteins and fit them together to give an icosahedral form. So we'll talk more about icosahedral symmetry on Monday. Hopefully you don't get blown away afterwards.